today we're going to be talking about why a fearful avoidant pulls away, but most importantly, what to do. And I brought my partner in crime, Tyler Ramsey, to help me answer this difficult question. Tyler is one of the coaches of ex-boyfriend recovery and ex-girlfriend recovery. He's sort of a superstar and I don't know if I want to say you have a specialization in attachment styles because you're a lot more than that, Tyler, but he's pretty good with attachment styles. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you, Chris? I know. I think I've got that claim to fame these days of the attachment style expert. <laughs> well, you know, what's kind of funny about that is oftentimes I'll be writing an article on uh, EBR about attachment styles. And I'm just like, you know what, it would be nice to break up some of this content with a nice video, right? So I'll, I'll go to YouTube and I'll type in like Chris Sider attachment styles or ex-boyfriend recovery attachment styles. And the very first video that shows up is our very first video together. So oh. I can't tell you how often I drop that into a random uh, article just to kind of like break the content up and illustrate the points I'm trying to make. So here we go again, round two. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I'm more than happy to do another one. <laughs> So why don't we just start at the top, you know, like for anyone who's not familiar with attachment styles and their importance, especially when it comes to um, exes and breakups and relationships in general, what is a fearful avoidant? Yeah, so I think yeah, that's a great question. And so really, I think you have to describe them all to, you know, describe a fearful avoidant. So really, there's there's three what we call insecure attachment styles. You have what we call the traditional anxious person. Um, and this person typically requires a lot of attention, affection, um, and they really like to feel close to their partners. It's not uncommon for them to, you know, want to spend every single day with them. Um, it's one of, it's, it, that, that's usually what you see with, with them. Um, I always say that, you know, the, what we call the core wound of them is that they have a fear of abandonment and being alone. And so that's what usually triggers them. And so that kind of leads me into the avoidant part, which, you know, so that then you have an avoidant, which is, you know, I think a lot of people are more common with the avoidant anxious or avoidant attachment style. And so those people typically, um, are a person that does not like a lot of emotional intimacy or vulnerability within a relationship. They typically revert a conversation back to someone else to talk about themselves. And that's how mm -hmm. you'll typically figure out if they're avoidant or not, instead of inwardly talking about themselves. And so they're really afraid of emotional connection. And they, for some reason, in their childhood learned that, you know, any, anytime they are vulnerable, it could be used against them. And therefore they don't rely on people and are very independent people. Mm -hmm. And so they value that. And so when they get in a relationship, they feel like they're going to lose their independency in some way, shape or form, which is why they're scared of one. Um, and then you've got the middle, which is a combo of the two that I, you know, talked about before, which is fearful avoidant, and they actually have anxious and avoidant qualities. And so those, those people possess them both. So depending upon who they're with depends on what side you're more going to see. So typically, you know, you're the anxious partner and you're with a fearful avoidant, let's assume you're probably going to see more of the avoidant qualities. And so just because that's usually what triggers them that way. And so really fearful avoidance and dismissive avoidance are pretty similar, except for one key factor is that fearful avoidance desire a relationship. They're just afraid of it. Hence mm -hmm. they're fearful avoidant. <laughs> that's yeah. why they were named that way. I said, whoever named it, you know, named, named it pretty clever because they like to get close to people quickly, but then you'll, you'll see them a month or two down the road. It's like they freeze when commitment starts to exist and then they pull away. And so yeah. because it's that avoidant quality of losing their independency within a relationship, even though they have an anxious quality that drives them to have emotional connection. Yeah, you know, what's, what's interesting about the fearful avoidance that I've tended to notice is 
each one is kind of unique and what sort of commitment level sets them off. So like I've noticed like some fearful avoidance are happy just to be in a relationship. But when you start talking about potentially like moving in together or um, marriage, that's what sets them off. Like each one has like these different tipping points. Most fearful avoidance, I find, try to like kind of exist in this gray area where they have one foot in the door and one foot out the door. Uh, so, and, and if you, if you like really think about it, it kind of makes sense because the fearful avoidant is someone who desires intimacy, yet they don't ever let anyone close enough to give them that intimacy. So the perfect situation for them is this sort of hot and cold type, uh, relationship. And to what Tyler was saying, just backing it up, you know, it does kind of stem back from childhood because a lot of times not to kind of throw parents under the bus, but the their childhood was stemmed from them getting basic needs like food, clothing, things like that. But the emotional needs not weren't necessarily met and they had to learn how to process things on their own. So like Tyler said, you know, you get these fearful avoidance who are incredibly independent because that's sort of their space, safe space. That's how they've learned how to process really difficult emotions at, at the childhood level. And it just kind of grows and, and sort of finds itself into relationships. And I'm kind of eager to get your take on this, but I've been thinking it, it's almost like this really unfortunate self-fulfilling cycle because a lot of times the parents of the fearful avoidant have avoidant tendencies as well. And it just kind of like, you know, the, the cycle repeats, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So you said a lot right there. And, you know, going back to the childhood aspect, Really, it's the emotional chaos that occurs as a child. And so a fearful avoidant has both. They have a parent that really, you know, will meet their emotional needs sometimes and then not in others. And so they do get this self-reliance, but they're not always sure when they're going to get it and when they're not, which is what creates that hot and coldness. Mm -hmm. And that's usually a, the differentiating factor from someone that's just fully avoidant. They, they never got their emotional needs met so they just self-rely on themselves altogether um but yeah like i said most of the time it's passed down from generation to generation because it is some kind of factor that's within the parents as well and so you see a lot in in most of the time you see with fearful avoid it they have some kind of trauma aspect to them whether it's physical emotional sexual abuse you see a lot of these things with them as well. And so, cause it's so many inconsistencies that they weren't really, or should not have been subjected to at an early child. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, I guess really what you're coming here for is to learn why they're pulling away and, Essentially, what we're trying to say is most of the time when a fearful avoidant is quote unquote pulling away in a relationship, it's because that is sort of the way they've learned how to cope with, to use Tyler's term, emotional chaos. And while maybe even like you have a relationship that is not considered emotional chaos, I think maybe they kind of build it up in their heads as being that way. I mean, do you, do you think that's like an accurate way of looking at it, Tyler? I agree. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And a lot of the times the people that find, you know, this kind of video, they're wanting, they usually have a self-reflection of something that they did to cause it. And that's not always the case. And so that's why I think that's a good thing to differentiate out. Sometimes it is, there's emotional chaos within a relationship that's, you know, that's not uncommon sometimes where you have a disagreement or that sort. But a lot of the times when they are dealing with stress, the fearful avoidant, and it's so overwhelming that they shut down also. And it's nothing that you did. It's something that's external that they're dealing with in their life, whether it be work or, you know, a living situation, that kind of thing that is so stressful that they pull away and go into what I call their cave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the way to look at it potentially is just like it's their coping mechanism mm -hmm. they know if they're the turtle and they kind of go into their shell or their cave they can um they, it's like a known commodity they they know for a fact doing this will help me deal with it emotionally kind of avoid the situation mm -hmm. um but that leads us to kind of to the more difficult, because like, it's kind of an easy answer. Like why do fearful avoidance pull away? You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're doing it as a coping mechanism, essentially the, 
the bigger challenge, especially when it comes to fearful avoidance, because we deal with this a lot. Um, I, I even, I bet you Tyler's dealt with more fearful avoidant exes than probably okay. a lot of people. Um, the challenge really is what do you do when you're dealing with the fearful avoidant? What can you do to kind of get them to come out and meet you halfway? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that's a great question. And I think that's always an, a question that is constantly I get even within my coaching sessions. And so really what you have to do is, is that there's really not a whole lot you can do to fix the situation. And so, and I know that's usually the approach that some people want to do. Let me text them. Let me do something for them. That kind of thing. Really giving them their space to do that and not freaking out is the best decision you could make. And I'll tell you a few reasons why, because a lot of the times when they have someone that comes in and tries to do a lot of things for them, they don't feel deserving of it anyway, because of the core wound that they have inside of them already. So they like to help others, but they don't like other people to help them. And yeah. so that's where the disconnect sometimes goes, where it's better to leave them in their own space to work through whatever stress that they've gotten inside their head, because they make very emotionally based decisions. They don't make always the most logical ones. They make the emotional ones shut down. And then later they figure out, oh, they were just overwhelmed and now they're okay. So a lot of the times you'll see them recover within the next three to five days is what I usually see on average. And so leaving them alone is really a great way to deal with the situation. Uh, I mean, yes, you know, we often say when they pull back, you pull back. But I think mm -hmm. what's interesting is um, it's, it's really easy to externalize or, or really look at the, you know, very core basic, like, Hey, when you start noticing a dip in them kind of like in their communication, their interest or whatever, pull back They're they're having one of their episodes, if you will. But what's really challenging is while Tyler is saying like, Hey, like if you just do this and wait three to five days on average, things will kind of return back to normal. The problem I think that Tyler has and that we really have collectively is we're dealing with very anxious people. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes when we tell them, Hey, like you need to pull back, that goes against their wiring because, you know, we, we've kind of talked about the wiring or the protection sort of aspect, coping mechanism of fearful avoidant, whereas an anxious person, their wiring is the exact opposite. They see a problem. Right. What do they do? They try to fix that problem. <laughs> and so us telling someone like three to like, Hey, it may take a couple of days, but you're going to have to give that person their space that goes against their wiring. And they have a really hard time of doing that. Mm -hmm. No, that's very, very true. Anxious people I always tell people a great positive attribute of an anxious person is that they are the best problem solvers you will ever have. And they really know how to meet the needs of other people, which is really a great quality. It can sometimes be too much though, for some people. And so that's why you're right. When you deal with an anxious person, they, they want to fix it, the situation and space is not a very comfortable thing for an anxious person because they, it triggers their fear of abandonment and being alone, which is why it feels that much more painful to them. And so they're thinking, oh, they're going to pull away. They're going to meet someone. They're going to leave me, that sort of thing because that's where they are triggered. And so, whereas the avoidant person's not thinking that way at all, they are just needing some time to get out of their head. And it's usually a big communication thing. And I tell, I tell a lot of the anxious people in my coaching sessions that you, the, the reason why you think the way you think is because that's what your brain is telling you, even though that's how you would respond to the situation, but that's not how other people would particularly respond to it. So that's why you think they're going to pull away. Yeah. I mean, it, it really goes back to that core wound concept you're talking mm -hmm. about with the anxious person, that fear of abandonment and to really piggyback and, and sort of hit the ball back on what you were saying with the problem solving thing. It's really interesting that that is the way you look at anxious people, you know, like they're the best problem solvers. And if that's the case, I feel like one of the best things you can do if you're struggling, giving a fearful avoidant their space 
is try to find something you care almost as much about as that person and problem solve that instead while you're kind of waiting for that space. Because sometimes I think it's really hard for an anxious person to turn off like a light switch, you know, that like their personality, they're just problem solvers. But maybe if you find some other purpose outside of the relationship, which is something I find personally that a lot of anxious people have difficulty with because so much of their identity is wrapped up into that relationship Mm -hmm. that sometimes when you sit them down and say like, Hey, what do you care about outside of your ex? Or what do you care about outside of the person you're dating? They can't answer it. Mm -hmm. You know, their whole world is this person. So I feel like sometimes with an anxious person, the smartest thing for them is to find a purpose outside of their ex that they can problem solve on to give their ex space. And that is kind of a secure tendency to begin with, right? Exactly. No, that's totally true. I think you hit it nail on the head. I think anxious people, the anxious people struggle to have an internal dialogue. And so they find an external dialogue by making other people happy. And so that's what makes them feel good. And that's why that that's why during my sessions, I tell people to develop what we in, in what we call in this um community is the trinity and mm-hmm. you know basically finding a sense of your own self on you know your hobbies your interests you know what makes you happy because that's what you should be doing um during all of this time yeah i mean totally agree and it's really interesting that you you really talk about the internal dialogue or the lack of having that internal dialogue and really uh the Trinity concept outside of the relationships component is all about sort of internal stuff, you know, even the physical aspect of it, like going for a run, weirdly enough, is one of the most internal dialogue sessions you will ever have because your brain and your mind is telling you this hurts, let's stop Mm -hmm. it. And you're Mm -hmm. having to tell your mind, no, we're going to keep going. You're, you're kind of having that internal dialogue. And then of course, you know, specifically with, I guess, with wealth, um, focusing on kind of your career, you can problem solve in that way and feel pressure internally. So sometimes like if you're focusing too much on other people and help like, like getting their, your value from those other people, you do take away from that internal dialogue. So I feel like maybe the key for an, uh, for an anxious person is to kind of intern, like as cliche and as dumb as this sounds like, focus on yourself, have the internal dialogue, get Mm -hmm. to know yourself, because at the end of the day, that's all you're going to be left with when it's all said and done, right? Mm -hmm. No, for sure. I think, I mean, I think that's a a great way to handle it. I always tell people if they're triggered to have things in place to cope with that trigger, whether it be going for a walk or going to the gym or going, you know, to see a friend, that sort of thing, so that you're not constantly running in circles in your mind at home, thinking the worst things possible, which is typically what happens when somebody like a fearful avoidant does pull away. And most of the time, if you wait, they come straight out of their head and they, they will be the ones that reach out more, a lot of the times. And so when they feel ready, and so the more times you do that, it shows emotional control on your part which allows a fearful avoidant to actually trust you even further, which will allow them to not deactivate nearly as often as the alone time that they would need usually. Yeah. Well, so what's kind of interesting is we've been talking about this from the, what you should do perspective, but what's interesting is we haven't really touched on what kind of you should not do. And, you know, for the, for the anxious person out there dealing with the fearful avoidant, what typically happens when the anxious person just won't stop trying to, because I mean, this is like, I'll give you a pretend scenario so we can kind of like be on the same page here. Let's imagine you've got two people. One is an anxious person. One is an avoidant person. The avoidant person pulls away. The anxious person immediately feels something is wrong. Why else would they pull away and they go and fix it? Now, what we're saying is what you should do is just leave it. The person will kind of deal with it on their own and then they'll probably come back and Mm -hmm. things will be kind of normal. But what happens when the person doesn't do that, when they give (laughs) in to their internal programming and just try to fix the problem again and again and again? 
Right. Yeah. And I think it's great. And a, a lot of my clients, like, I like to explain the psychology of it. So when you do not do something like that, what you do is you push them when they are already emotionally drained. And so, like I said, the fearful avoidant part is they're afraid of intimacy and vulnerability in emotions. And when you push that further and further, they retract further and further and they feel like they can't trust you and they don't want to be around you because you, they, they look at you as emotional chaos <laughs> that is going to require a lot from them that they can't give you. And if they don't feel like they can give you something, remember these people are chronic people pleasers, then they will pull away even further because they don't feel like they can make your needs. And that is the root of all insecure attachment style. So you mentioned that the anxious person has this core wound, this, this deep fear of being abandoned. Mm -hmm. What would you like in terms of a core wound, what would you say the avoidant person's core wound is specifically the fearful avoidant person's core wound? Yeah. So I think fearful avoidants actually have two. And because they have both sides of them, I think they definitely have a fear of abandonment, when, especially if they're more with an avoidant person, because the avoidant person is going to win out. <laughs> and so they're going to be triggered anxious. So they're going to feel like that person's pulling away, that they're not good enough for them, that they are afraid they'll leave them. And a lot of the times you'll see them in a relationship before a full avoidant will for that reason, because they shut down and pull away because they're afraid they're going to be hurt. But the avoidant side of them also has a core wound of a lack of independency in losing yourself within someone. And yeah. so that's really what the other side of them is. So really, because I mean, like, uh, really when we're dealing it's always funny because when I write articles, I'm always talking about sort of like the four attachment styles, secure, anxious, avoidant, fearful, right? Um, but really, there's only two attachment styles. There are secure attachment styles and insecure attachment yes. styles. And the insecure attachment styles have the three sort of subcategories of anxious, avoidant, and fearful. But really, the funny part is about it is there's really only two core wounds that people can have. Some people have both, but you know, you have the fear of abandonment and mm -hmm. then you have a loss of independence, a fear of, of losing thyself in the relationship of, of, and then what's really interesting is we see that a lot with avoidance where they freak out because they think they're going to lose whatever independence they have in that relationship. And mm -hmm. that's all she wrote. But the, the fascinating part to me is with a fearful person, they have like both, both of these core wounds. You got the fear of abandonment and then the fear of uh, losing yourself. And this makes total sense when you consider they, they kind of enjoy being in this hot and cold relationship where one minute the paradox is they want love and the other minute they don't want love. And really what that is, is the two core wounds having this battle internally. Right. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. No, that's, that's totally true. I always relate them to as a pendulum where they're going to swing one way and they are always going to come back the other way. <laughs> so you just have to give them enough time to be able to do it. And so, but when you have someone that's fully pushing them, the pendulum doesn't, is not allowed to come back unless you actually create that space for them. Now, I do want to say one thing. Um, for any of you who are kind of losing hope here a little bit, uh, because what's funny is like anytime I'll do a YouTube video or even like some of the, I don't, I don't know if you've ever done this, but you, have you ever looked at like the very first, um, interview that we did together and looked at the comments, uh, specifically in relation to fearful avoidance. And people are like, I will never get into a relationship with a fearful avoidant. That's being in a relationship with an avoidant is the worst thing possible. I wanted to say it's not like all hope is lost, right? We gave you kind of the anxious coping mechanism of just like, hey, give them space. But also there's this concept of secure attachment sort of gravity where, and I feel like that is really lost and I don't really see anyone talking about this concept. Mm -hmm. I mean, ha have you seen anyone talk about this concept? I don't think so. Not that I know of, or it's, you know, it's very far and few between. There might be a few people out there. Um, yeah. But I think it's a great topic because really 
you know, being a secure person, you're way less likely to be subjected to the currents, I call it, of another person pushing and pulling or pulling away and coming forward because a secure person stands on their own and they can handle it a little bit more. And so, and of course, it'll wear a secure person down over a long period of time, but it's not within days. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you like the way I always try to view it is you have the four main attachment styles, right? The secure person. So like each time it's like, it's like a chemistry experiment. Each time you get into a new relationship with someone where each person has their own attachment style and they bring to the table. Right. So ideally you get a perfect relationship where you get two secure people together, but guess what? That's not ever how it ends up working, at least in the relationship advice space, because oftentimes when two secure people are together, they don't feel the need to go on YouTube and look for relationship help advice. They're not having huge relationship problems. I mean, they, they can, but it's usually mm-hmm. rare. Usually what we're getting are kind of the more extreme, anxious and avoidant and fearful type um, components. But I always kind of view it, Tyler, as this chemistry experiment where you have the two attachment styles, you have an anxious person and an avoidant person. And then when they get together, s- someone's going to win out. You know, like the anxious person is going to overcome the avoidant person or the avoidant person somehow is going to overcome the the anxious person somehow, or even having a secure person get in a relationship to your point with, uh, let's say an avoidant person, Mm -hmm. it's going to, one of these people is going to kind of impose their attachment will on the other. And what's interesting about the secure attachment style is that if you can remain secure and secure person has no problem giving an avoidant person space, right? They're, they're cool with that, but they can actually through just experience show an avoidant person, what a secure relationship is supposed to be like. Mm -hmm. And the avoidant can actually learn more secure tendencies. Yes, exactly. And that's kind of what I, you know, stated a little bit earlier in a little bit less detail, but Basically, you know, a secure person is going to give them that space that they need, that an avoidant does need. And then over time, if it's done correctly, and usually it is with a secure person, they are less likely to go in what I call their cave because they are not afraid that that person is going to go crazy when they do it because it's not emotional chaos. And they're allowed to do that because they get that freedom of space and independency that they do crave. I mean, I don't know how to say it any better where I think we kind of nailed it uh, not to sort of pat ourselves on the back a little bit, (laughs) but let's talk a little bit about coaching with you. So for anyone who doesn't know, Tyler is a coach uh, within the X recovery program. Um, People aren't aware. I, we don't really do a great job of probably explaining it. So we're going to do that right here. So like, <laughs> let's pretend I'm, I'm a, I'm your coaching client, Tyler. What exactly is the experience like, um, when I sign up for a coaching session with you? Yeah. So, um, actually you get a one hour session one-on-one with me. Um, and basically we talk about your individual situation and I actually go over the goals of, you know, the client. So what do they want to obtain from the session? What do they, what would they like to see, you know, come out of the situation? And then towards the end, we come up with solutions on how to move forward, but it's an individualized game plan on exactly, you know, what variables that you may be facing and how to overcome those challenges. Um, And you also get a recording of the session and a personalized game plan afterwards as well. Um, which is really nice. There's been a lot of people that have really enjoyed it and have gotten really positive results out of it. Yeah. And the one thing I will say is most of the time we're dealing with um, people going through breakups, right? That's kind of where we've focused our attention, but that doesn't mean that the principles that we're teaching and applying or that Tyler specifically is teaching and applying can't be um, used in all sorts of other areas of dating. I mean, attachment styles is not just a uh, subject to breakups. It's mm-hmm. subject to pretty much all types of relationship situations. So even if you're kind of sitting there and thinking like, 
you're watching this and you're just interested in the attachment style portion and you're having trouble uh, with uh, maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something, um, we can actually help you understand sort of the, the their language, I guess is the best way to, to, to put it. Like, especially if you have anxious tendencies, you're not going to be speaking the avoidance language, even though we kind of gave away some trade secrets on this. So <laughs> <laughs> that's right. No, I, I mean, I actually have had quite a few clients that have just been in relationships also that, you know, just kind of wanted to get a better understanding of their own relationship and how to improve it. And it's not necessarily a breakup also. Yep. So if you want to sign up for a coaching session with Tyler or learn more about coaching sessions with Tyler, just simply look in the description link of this YouTube video, click on the link you see there and we'll get you hooked up. Uh, other than that, I just wanted to say, Tyler, we knocked it out of the park again. So thank you for coming on and basically making my job 10 times easier. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, I'm always happy to come on to the channel. Um, I think we should have people drop their questions, any kind of questions that they may have specifically to their situation on any kind of fearful avoidant um, that you'd like to see in future videos. Oh boy, he just opened up the floodgates. <laughs> All right.